Hello everybody and welcome to this video. Today we're going to talk about the AIM SW4. Now this is a replacement for the old Formula Wheel 3, so anyone who's got a Formula car or somebody who just likes to have all the information on the steering wheel in front of them, this video is potentially for you. Now the thumbnail is entitled, is this overkill in a Formula Ford? Well, we're gonna to get to that as we go through, but I'm gonna go through different aspects of the things that I really like about the wheel, the things that uh, I don't really like, and a few tips and best practices that I've learned along the way for you to be able to make the right choice and then decide if it is potentially overkill for you because this wheel could potentially apply to anyone in any vehicle who's used to using AIM devices. Before I go any further, it's important to be able to note that this unit was sent to me by AIM Shop and that it's been installed in my Formula Ford for about six months now. So I've been using it on and off as I've raced to be able to get a good idea of it. So all of my thoughts on this are based upon experiences. Now I don't have it with me here today, it's actually in my race car, so I will have photographs throughout which show the installation and how it's being used. But at the same time, I think that it's important for me to be able to share what I've learnt. So without further ado, let's get into the key areas that I really like about this. And for me, there are many, many features that I really do like. Now, I do love technology. I do love having every possible piece of data that's available to me. And so this wheel worked particularly well for me. Now, the first is we have to uh, sort of discuss the device itself. If any of you are used to using a logger and a wheel connected or a logger and a dash, so for example, if you happen to be in the Formula 4 community or anyone who's used any of these in any of the sort of uh, Formula cars that use AIM devices, chances are you've used something like an Evo 4 or an Evo 4S with either a GS dash or one of the Formula Wheel 3s. So in that instance, one of the key differences that's immediately relevant is the fact that we're now talking about a unit which is uh, both the wheel and the logger all in one. It's all in one and it's contained in one unit. Now that's a really nice thing to be able to have because one of the key aspects that you have in a Formula car is space and space is a premium. So if you can have everything actually in the wheel itself, it potentially has the opportunity of being able to save space elsewhere in the car. Now we'll discuss that a bit later on in terms of some of the sort of the tips and best practices that I've learned, but that's the first thing. It's all contained in one unit. That also means when you start looking at pricing up these options, uh, it may seem like this Formula wheel or this SW4 is a little bit more expensive. And it may be a touch more expensive, but the reality is, is that if you've had to buy a logger and a dash and all the other components to go with it, chances are the prices aren't gonna to be too far off. So knowing it's all in one is the first feature. The second, which I really love, is this is the latest technology from AIM. It means you get all the features that sometimes aren't available if you have the older tech. Even though the Evo 4S is still on sale today, there are certain things you can't do with it that you can with the more modern day equipment. I put a video out recently talking about setting your own predictive lap time, where you can upload laps that you want to chase in the car rather than necessarily chasing the auto-generated one that the, the device itself creates. These sort of features are only available with a modern day machinery and so that's a huge plus. Add to that other aspects that this is just like a dash and so the more modern day dashes have the opportunity to be able to bring in a lot more channels and a lot more ECU feed. So another great example would be if you happen to be someone who does have an ECU feed coming into an Evo 4S as an example, you may not be able to have additional sort of feeds. And so to put that in, in reality, if you have a tire pressure monitoring system that comes in through an ECU port. And so if you've only got one, you can either use the ECU from the car or you can use the ECU that comes in from the tire pressure monitoring system. This allows you to do both. And so I think it's important to be able to note this has additional channels and input, which is quite a nice thing to have as we all start to add more devices in our cars. The next thing I love is the customization. Anyone who's used one of the MX series dashes knows that you can customize each of your pages. You can do a lot of really nice things uh, to be able to customize your view. For me personally, I have a page for qualifying, a page for race, a page for, a page for just understanding the engine health, uh, for example. And I also have a page dedicated to tires. We have tire pressure, uh, tire temperatures, and brake bias. And so I'm able to be able to adjust and work through that. And so 
Having that customization is a really nice feature to be able to have, and that's an important thing if you're someone who wants to be able to have a very sort of, you know, personal experience with the dash itself. Add to that, one of the other key things that I absolutely love, and this is by far my favorite, it seems a bit sort of trivial in nature in terms of what it is, but I love the tactile nature of the buttons. And let me talk through this just a little bit as well. Despite all the wonderful things with the, the unit itself, one of the key things, you can see it in this picture behind me, the green dial that's in the middle, is a turning dial. It's very tactile. So if you happen to be somebody who's in a race, or you're doing 100 plus miles an hour and you want to toggle between screens, you might have some additional piece of information, something feels weird and you want to see if you've got a puncture. Being able to find those tiny little silver buttons and be able to say which channel, which dash, cancel something, it's all very difficult to be able to do. Whereas with a big turning dial, it's a much easier way of being able to toggle through the screens, which I absolutely love because I'm one of those who wants the absolute bare minimum of information in the car with me. All I need is to be able to make sure the car can get from the beginning to the end of the race without any concerns. And if there are concerns, only then am I told. So to have this in the car and a quick tactile turn of a dial is a huge plus that is there. So these are the things that I really, really like about the unit itself. And I have to say that even though this goes into a Formula car for me now, I've driven sedan cars, I drove BMWs a lot when I lived overseas in the US, this would be something that I would prefer to have there. I'm very comfortable now with having everything on the steering wheel in front of me. I have it, for example, in my sim racing setup and I love all of that information on the actual steering wheel very close to fingers and, and, and opportunities to be able to press buttons. So I love that particular feature a lot. And so that's a huge plus. Now, it's important that we talk about the things that I don't like or I think everyone should know that potentially needs to be addressed. And the first, is that the setup of this unit has quite a steep learning curve. If you really wanna take advantage of this particular unit, you wanna take advantage of those turning dials, whatever need be, this has quite a steep learning curve. Now, what I'm gonna do in the next following weeks is I will send out a video which talks about configuring this and understanding how to be able to set up the buttons and the dials, but it is a little bit more of a learning curve than somebody who's used to something like an AIM Solo, a Solo 2, all the way through to somebody who's using an Evo 4S potentially with a GS dash or a wheel. So there is quite a steep learning curve. If you get it right, it's wonderful. But to get to that particular point, it requires a bit of study and a bit of working through a lot of the tutorials, which typically are found either from AIM or I hope to be able to provide some on this channel as well. The second thing which I don't potentially like about this as well is that it does feel like there's a bit of redundancy. Now, whether it's overkill or not, we'll discuss at the end of the video, but at the same time, I like having the key buttons which I can cancel or swap sort of pages, but at the same time, there will be buttons that I'm not using, and these are really set up for somebody who might have this with a more advanced setup. If you're using the PDM or the power distribution modules where you can press a button and it tells the car to do something, or you've got other elements of the feed coming in from the ECU where you wanna be able to see different information, these buttons are fantastic for you. And as I said, this is not a review of the unit for somebody who just has a car like mine without an ECU or a very basic ECU. If you've got a really more modern advanced car, a lot of these PDM setups, this wheel gets even better for being able to set up. However, if you are somebody like me who's only using the bare minimum, there will be redundancy. But I think it's fair to say that there was also redundancy that exists in the Formula Wheel 3 that existed beforehand. And so being comfortable with the fact that there will be stuff that you don't use is going to be important. The other things that I don't like is that you can have configuration overload. One of the key aspects is the simplicity of a GS dash or the wheel or Solo 2, whatever people have used and sort of small MXM is that you have very little configuration, which means that you have to keep it simple to make it function. Here you have so much more screen real estate to add all sorts of sort of channels and gauges and information that you can get to the point where it's overkill and you do move into that tendency of size 12 font sort of uh, indicators, which you cannot read if you look down with your crash helmet on or you're looking down at a glance. So that's something that needs to be addressed as we go through 
And then the last thing I think is important is that depending on the type of car you have, you have to be aware of certain key components. Like if you're bringing in RPM information from your RPM coil, then the same unit which is drawing power is also drawing off the same battery which is drawing off of the, uh, the power source that fires the, the, the spark plugs. And so you may see fluctuation that exists in RPM signals or whatever need be. So it's important to be able to address that. You should be okay with the battery on the wheel, but if you start adding other power hungry units as well, for example, you may have a Smarty Cam Jewel or one of the more sort of sort of draining sort of elements on the battery. For example, if you happen to be running or with a rain light attached in a Formula Ford, we have a battery that should last the whole race. It doesn't get charged during the race, so we've got to be aware of that as well. So while it's not necessarily something I don't like, it's something you need to be aware of to be able to say whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, and I think you have to be able to adapt. Now, if we think about being able to sort of come up with a few areas of sort of tips and tricks that I've learned along the way, the very first addresses the last point. Install an RPM filter. They're not expensive. You can get them from AIM and they just smooth out that signal. That is essential. That is a must as you put it in. But I have to say, I recommended those with any of the previous setup as well. But it is absolutely essential if you have this in a Formula wheel like a, like a Formula Ford car and, and use it that way. The second thing is make sure you're very aware of the size. Now these wheels go up in size. I have the 270 size, but they do get bigger and bigger. And as they get bigger, the screen gets bigger. You can put more on it, but at the same time, be very conscious of the fact you may not be able to display as much on the smaller screen as you can the bigger one. So know which one works for you in terms of where it is. The last thing I will also say in tips and tricks is if you are somebody like me who needs additional channels like a throttle position, brake pressure sensors, RPM, oil pressure, water temp, whatever need be, you're going to have to get very comfortable with being able to understand how the channels work, having a channel expansion port and a data hub, understanding how that sort of schema works or how everything connects together is very important. So on the screen right now I'm showing one of the examples that I have for my car. Be very aware of the fact that you may need additional components to be able to feed in there and have all the connectors that are there. But at the same time, it shouldn't necessarily be too difficult. And we figured it out in my car, so you should be fine. Outside of that, it really leaves me to finish off this video to be able to say, is it overkill or not? Well, I think that you could argue, yes, there's going to be a bit of redundancy in terms of the dials and everything that you have. But at the same time, if you're somebody who wants a Formula wheel, this is the only option you really have now from AIM as they've discontinued the previous one. So if you want to have a normal steering wheel with a dash added onto it, that's your only other option. So I think first and foremost, this might be an option that is viable just because the alternatives might not necessarily be as good. Having the additional screen is fantastic to be able to configure it. The turn dials, I don't think that's overkill. That works really well for me as well. Redundant buttons does feel like it's a bit over the top. So again, that's something that's there. But I have to say above all, that if you're looking for an all-in-one unit that's easy to be able to have, you're very comfortable, for example, somebody who you're very comfortable with being able to have all of the buttons close to thumbs or fingers as need be, then this is absolutely fantastic for you no matter what is happening. And so no, I don't think it's overkill, but at the same time, it is different. It is a different sort of learning experience and it also requires a fair amount of configuration. So be very conscious of that as well. It just leaves me to be able to say thank you so much for watching this video. Keep an eye out for the configuration video that I will put up in the next couple of weeks so you can have a look at how I've configured it in my car and how it might work for you. But remember that if you get this wheel and you've got a much more advanced and modern car, same thing will apply as to what I'm showing you how to set up as it has done on many of the dashes I've shown to set up before because that's what it really is. It's one of the AIM dashes built into the wheel together, so it's all in one unit. So anyone who's familiar and comfortable with being able to set up uh, a normal AIM dash will have the necessary experience here. The bit that's the learning curve is how to make sure the buttons are all configured necessary and right. So as said, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like it, thumbs up, subscribe, and this is, is of use to you. Please be able to make sure that you let me know in the comments below so that I can ensure that I can pass any feedback on to AIM themselves. So thanks so much for watching.